Well, fasten your safety belts for the second half of this lecture because we're going to go on a pretty bumpy ride. We've looked into false Protestantism or the false prophet. The Bible warns us about mystic Babylon having three components. The dragon, the beast, and the false prophet. And we're starting to look into Protestantism and see whether we can find any undercurrents that are leading Protestantism back to Rome. We saw the Hall of Fame where the Freemasons, there's 33 degree Freemasons who are the head of many of the churches. Insider infiltration. Remember that Freemasonry has been set up to, to, by the Jesuits to s do the work amongst Protestants. Well, let's continue on. We, un we know that Robert Schuller is a 33rd degree Freemason. And we understand from his works what the impact has been. And I'll show you a little bit more in a, in a, in a moment. But you remember that some of the works he wrote was Discover Your Possibilities. That Billy Graham says that Robert Schuller has got a tremendous ministry. And when he says the Our Father, he says, Hallowed be or honorable be, honorable be our name. Remember that? Right, so now we're going to move on. Who has this Robert Schuller influenced? Is there anybody in modern uh, Protestantism that we can see that they've got the characteristics of this Schuller ideology? Well, let's go and have a look what, what this quote says. Dr. Robert Schuller, was, he once said, I was the first person to introduce real church growth to the American church. He, meaning Bill Hybels, became the first guy to take these principles, refine them, maximize them to the ultimate length of their potential. I'm so proud of him. I think of him as a son. I think of him as one of the greatest things to happen to Christianity in our time. Bill Hybels is doing one of the best jobs of anybody I know. Isn't that incredible? Bill Hybels from Willow Creek. Bill Hybels that's world famous and got such a success rate with his Christianity or the, the, the type of Christianity that he puts out. He comes from the same fold as Robert Schuller. I wonder whether we've got any undercurrents there. That's why the Bible specifically says it's not going to be there where all the cars are. It's going to be the little narrow gate. That's where the Lord will be. 26th of January 2004, Robert Schuller's institute asked, Is your church all God wants it to be? Send your pastors and lay church leaders to the 34th Robert H. Schuller Institute for Successful Church Leadership, which brings together the most prominent pastors who make faith come alive in some of the country's largest churches. Bill Hybels of Willow Creek Community Church and Rick Warren of Saddleback Church. Now listen, both graduates of the institute. Robert Schuller is saying both Bill Hybels and Rick Warren are graduates of the Schuller Institute. They are both two protégés that have gone out into the world. Now, now Rick Warren is known as the world's favorite pastor. We're going to have to find out what he says in a moment. Robert Schuller says, and then there's Rick Warren, a pastor who today is phenomenal. He came to our institute time after time. And in Christianity Today, his wife was quoted as saying, when we come to that institute, we are blown away how God has blessed him. And today, Rick Warren is blessing millions of people. Rick Warren is seen as the world's favorite pastor. Time magazine spoke about him uh, and they called him the man with the purpose. Rick Warren, the author of The Purpose Driven Church, The Purpose Driven Life, The Purpose Driven Everything. Who's this Rick Warren and what does he stand for? Well, we know that he comes from the, Bill, uh, the, the same as Bill Hybels from the Robert Schuller Institute. And we know that that's an infiltrating center where a uh, 33rd degree Freemason puts his theologies in place to drive into Christianity with certain slight errors in place. Now, I want you to remember that, well, think about this as an example. If you were to eat something, say for example a hamburger, and it's 99.995% good food, would you eat it? I would. I would have previously. I think there's more uh, sustenance and more healthy food in the McDonald's burger than the 99.995%. I think there's more, how, rather, more bad stuff in a McDonald's burger than 99.995% good food. So this 0.005%, why then 
if we would eat it, why what, would you still eat it if I gave you the name of the product and I call it rat poison? You see, when it comes to rat poison, the reason the rat eats the stuff in the first place is because it's 99.995% good food. But it's the 0.005% that kills him. And that's the thing with these people, is it's 99.995% truth, but it's 0.005% error. And it's that that kills the soul in the end. Read with me from the Purpose Driven Life. I've taken a photograph of the page that you can see it comes from his work. Read this with me. Rick Warren writes, Today there's a growing interest in the second coming of Christ and the end of the world. Well, so there should be, I believe. When will it happen? Just before Jesus ascended to heaven, the disciples asked him the same question. And his response was quite revealing. He said, it is not for you to know the times or the dates the Father has set by His own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witness in, witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and the ends of the earth. I beg your pardon? What did God say when, when His disciples came to Him and said, tell us what will be the sign of the end of the world and of, the, of your coming? He said, be careful that no man deceive you. Here He says, no, 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 no. It's none of your business. And if you don't believe me, read on. When the disciples wanted to talk to Jesus about prophecy, Jesus quickly switched the conversation to evangelism. He wanted them to concentrate on their mission in the world. He said, in essence, the details of my return are none of your business. What is your business is the mission I've given you. Focus on that. Speculating on the exact timing of Christ's return is futile because Jesus said, no one knows the hour of the day or, or the day or the hour, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. You see the rat poison here? We don't have to speculate on the day or the hour of Jesus' return, but we do need to watch the signs. And Jesus Christ didn't tell his disciples it's none of your business. He wouldn't have wept. Remember he wept, he, he looked over Jerusalem and he wept and he said, You didn't know the hour of your visitation. Jesus Christ wept over Jerusalem because they weren't watching prophecy. He wept over Israel because he said that you didn't know the time. Paul writing to Galatians said, When the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his Son. Once the prophecies had been fulfilled, prophecy is absolutely critical to not, not only understanding where we are in the stream of time, but getting away from deception. And here the world's favorite pastor says that Jesus Christ, when his disciples came to him and asked him, Lord, tell us, what is the sign of your coming? How will we know what to look out for? He says, ah, it's none of your business. And he quickly switches the conversation from prophecy to evangelism. That's rubbish. That's absolute lie. Jesus Christ didn't do that. Have a look what he says on page 286. If you want Jesus to come back sooner, Focus on fulfilling your mission, not figuring out prophecy. Man, if we didn't figure out prophecy, we wouldn't know where we were. Yes, I agree. And there's the good food. Focus on your mission about fulfilling your role of evangelizing. Absolutely. But boy, balance it out with prophecy. Otherwise, what would prophecy be for? Why is 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 20 and 21 there in the Bible then? Just check it out. This is from the English Standard Version. It says, Do not despise prophecies, but test everything and hold fast what is good. Don't despise prophecy. Don't reject it. Don't push it away. Embrace it. Understand it. Study it that you can test everything. If you can't test it, if it's not part of the prophecies, it's not from God. And here this man says, It's none of your business. Jesus Christ says, It's none of your business to the disciples. Please. It's a big lie. In fact, I'll even go as far to say it's satanic. Why do I say it's satanic? Well, I'll quote you from a satanic high priest. I'm not saying Rick Warren is satanic. I'm saying that he is thinking the way Satan wants Christians to think. This is a quote from a satanic high priest. This is somebody that's in conversation with the devil. He says the following. Having a background of experience measured in millenniums, they, the demons, are engaged in a fierce conflict for the control of men's minds, a conflict against the forces from above. The spirits, those are the fallen angels or the demons, would encourage people to listen to their feelings instead of the word of Christ and his prophets. You see here, this is a satanic high priest saying this is what the demons want. 
They want you to have liturgy, to have you dancing around. Put your Bible down. Don't worry about that old stuff. We'll feel our relationship with God. We don't worry about prophecy. Ah, Jesus Christ told his disciples to, it's none of your business when, I'm, when I come back. That's satanic thinking, not godly thinking. And you, all you have to do is go onto the very front page of Rick Warren's website. And there you see Saddleback Church, Lake Flor Forest, California. The up in the top left, you see a hint of what possibly could be a, a, a sun symbol. But then down at the bottom, you say, see it says, see our service. And then next to that, hear our music. Music is absolutely critical to the success of, of Rick Warren's theology. He gets people to forget about reading the Word of God and gets them ad absorbed in, in uh, just feeding on their emotions. And if you don't uh, believe what I'm saying, I'm going to support everything that I'm saying now by their own quotations. I'm not saying it, they're saying it. But the reason why the rat eats the poison is because it's 99.995% good food. A person like Rick Warren makes all the right noises, he writes all the right books, and then he puts in these stupid little things about don't figure out prophecy, and he just gets people to step offline ever so slightly, and boom, they fall into a trap. This quote says, both Bill Hybels and Rick Warren have gone to say, it is critical that we keep in mind a fundamental principle of Christian communication. Now listen, this is what Bill Hybels and Rick Warren says. The audience not the message, is sovereign. Our message has to be adapted to the needs of the audience. It's people that matter more than what God wants. We have to change God's, God's uh, a message into something that is more suitable for mankind because it's our needs that need to be fulfilled. He has, has got this idea that we need to keep on focusing on man's needs and fulfill them. If you don't know what I'm saying, just have a look at this. This is from his own work. Figure out what mood you want your service to project and then create it. So figure out what you want your mood, not what the message must be from God, what mood you want to project. Then we make a strategic decision to stop singing hymns in our seeker services. Saddleback now has a more complete pop rock orchestra. Use more performed music than congregational singing. The ground we have in common with unbelievers is not the Bible, but it's our common needs, hurts and interests as human beings. You cannot start with a text. <laughs> wow. So I can't start the service by saying, right, open your Bibles and let's see what Revelation 22 has to say. Let's discuss the prophecies in Jeremiah. Let's discuss the various things that have been said by Daniel. You can't do that. Now put your Bible down and let's have a pop rock orchestra and get the liturgy going and we can get all excited and we get the congregation involved in dancing rather than congregational singing. You wouldn't want that. You must create the mood and adapt the message to suit the needs of your people. Christ says exactly the opposite. I'll get to that in a moment. Rick Warren uses the very same methodology as Robert Shuler and Bill Hybels. Warren spent 12 weeks going door to door and surveying the needs of the people. Therefore, he offers what he calls a full menu of support groups for empty nesters, divorced couples, grief recovery, etc. In other words, offer the community or the consumer what they want and they will come. See the problem here? It's got to do with needs-based religion. It's got to do with recognizing the requirement or the need within you to make you more comf comfortable. This is the most subtle form of pantheism available in the world today. It's acknowledging the needs of the individual so that you can make them feel better about themselves. Releasing the certain godhood within. Not only that, it's not based on what God wants to say to you. It's based on relieving the trauma or, or making your life easier. I don't come to church now to receive the true word of God. I come to church because I can have my car serviced or my daughter needs braces and I know that there are certain orthodontists there or whatever. I need a bank loan and if I sit next to my buddy then I might. It's needs-based needs religion. There's an agenda with going to church. That's what he says, not me. He says it himself. But the Bible says completely the opposite. It says, don't worry about your needs. Worry about what the Lord wants and then the rest will happen automatically. We can't change the word of God to suit us. 
Man, imagine it was changed every century to suit the different people of the different eras. Read with me from Matthew what it says in Matthew 6 verse 31 to 33. Therefore we take no thought, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or wherewithal shall we be clothed? For after those things do the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knoweth that you have need of all these things, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Don't go to church for needs-based religion, to feel better about yourself or to have something, have a consequence for going there to get something better in your life. Go to church to receive the word of God. If you seek first the kingdom of God, God knows what you need. He will give it to you. And that's the problem with the new age theory as well. The self-help idea where you can help yourself. There's no such thing as helping yourself. Either God gives it to you or Satan gives it to you. There's only two options available. This idea of a man-based theology comes from Vatican II. This idea of searching the people to find out for 12 weeks, what do you need, what do you need, what do you need, what do you need? And then putting this together in a church to supply the needs of the people. That comes all the way from Vatican II. Again, we have to look at the Catholic system to see what they say. Read this with me. It is man himself who must be saved. It is mankind that must be renewed. It is man, therefore, who is the key to this discussion. Man considered whole and entire, the body and the soul, heart and the conscience, mind and will. You see, it is man who's the most important part. We need to adjust this word to suit mankind. He says in, in his book, on uh, page 280 and 281, about this idea of music. The style of music you choose in your church will be one of the most critical and controversial decisions you make in the life of your church. It may also be the most influential factor in determining whether or not your church grows. You must match your music to the kind of people God wants you to, your church to reach. <laughs> you see the problem? They, they, everything they do, they blame on God. So you must match your music to the people that God wants you to reach. Who does God want you to reach? Everyone. So that's why you can't have every type of music. You've got to have God's type of music. So they say, no, 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 no. We don't want God's music. We must match it and then blame God. The people that God wants us to reach. He wants us to reach this group or he wants us to reach that group. So they blame God. Then it goes a little bit further. I'll be honest with you. We are loud. We are really, really loud on a weekend service. I say we're not going to turn it down. Now the reason why is baby boomers want to feel the music, not just hear it. God loves variety. They think, Phew, it's God's problem. It's His fault. He's the one that's making us dance up and down and put our Bibles down and you know, swing our arms and clap our hands. He loves variety, so we're just following what He wants. And then Rick Warren in The Purpose Driven Life put the, the full stop at the end of this rubbish. He says, now look how he blames God. God loves all kind of music because he invented it. All fast and slow, loud and soft, old and new. There is no biblical style. It's, it's his problem. <laughs> See, it's like in the Garden of Eden. <laughs> yeah, but, but the woman that you gave me, it's actually your fault, God, because the woman that you gave me made me eat. It's your music. You invented it, God. No, God didn't invent heavy metal. He didn't invent the trash music that we listen to today in the world. That doesn't come from God. At, you see, the problem is that people don't understand this thing about two sets of angels. Lucifer, when he was heaven, was head of the music division. And he came down with that talent and he set up many different types of music. And then you cannot say there's no biblical style. Of course there's a biblical style, but it certainly doesn't include drums. Because once you put a set of drums in your congregation, then it goes to the next thing and then goes to the next thing and eventually they're standing and then just all you do is you just drag it out and it gets worse and worse and worse and worse. And then you end up having you two Eucharists in your congregation and I don't know what all. It starts by the little things, keeping control of the little things. That's how, it con that how you get control of this thing. Not by throwing your Bible down and dancing in your, your arms in the air. Does Rick Warren know about the Reformation? Does he understand what it is to be a Protestant? Well, let's ask him. The first Reformation, he says, was about belief. This one is going to be about behavior, said Warren. The first one was about creeds. This one's going to be about deeds. 
The first one divided the church. This time it will unify the church. What's Rick Warren's agenda? Unity in error. The Protestants divided away from Rome to get away from the persecution and to get away from the false doctrines. Him with his false doctrines is saying this reformation will unify the church. He is part of the counter-reformation. Not only that, just have a look at this. This is in a, a group email to the Saddleback people. He says, Dear Saddleback family, this week I shared part of this message in New York City where I spoke at the United Nations and also to the Council of Foreign Relations. Now you've got to be very, 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 very influential and very, very, very deeply involved to speak at the United Nations. But when they call you into the Council of Foreign Relations to come and speak there, then there's various things that have to be in place before that. Let me read you another quote that comes from a letter from Rick Warren to Joseph Farrow. It says, As a member of the Council on Foreign Relations and Oxford Analytica, I might know as much about the Middle East as you. As a what? He said, as a member of the Council on Foreign Relations? Remember this is the secret organization that is working towards one world government under Lucifer? Wow! Unbelievable! Does he know what he's part of? I don't know. Who am I to judge? All I can do is I can look at the liturgy and the various things going on in his church and I say, is it biblical? I'm sorry, it's not biblical. Do I want any part of it? No, I don't. Do I want to be part of the reformation that unites the church unity in error? No, I'm sorry, I don't. What about the other pastors? We've looked at um, Bill Hybels, Rick Warren, Robert Schuller, many others. What about the others? Are there others that have got these influences? Well, Benny Hinn. Let's just look for a moment at Benny Hinn. Here is an image of him sitting with all his prayer requests. Thousands upon thousands of prayer requests that come in. And another image with him with his, uh, it, it, he wears a suit that hints towards the Catholic system. Well, uh, Benny Hinn is known as a Templar. Do you remember the Templars? The insider Johannism, the outsider Catholicism, the people that spit on the cross. He's a person that comes across as if he's a Christian, but yet inside he isn't? Well, if he wasn't a true Christian, why would he be able to say in this quote on our position in Christ, the word made flesh, audio tape side two, he says, don't say I have, rather say I am, I am, I am, I am. This is calling yourself God. Surely Benny Hinn wouldn't say that. He's such a godly man. Well, what about this? Listen to this and tell me who says this. Don't tell me you have Jesus. You are everything he was and everything he is and ever shall be. Don't tell me you have Jesus. You are everything that he was and everything that he is and everything that he shall be. You are Jesus Christ. That's what he's teaching. Might not know it. And then when he puts his hand up and he goes, Wah, fire. What he's doing is mesmerism. This comes from ancient, or ancient times as well, but especially from mesmer, mesmerizing the people, hypnotizing them into believing certain things. This man is an inside infiltrator. What about Benny Hinn praising the name of the Lord Satan? Is that possible? I don't know. Check it out. Come on, people. Let me hear and praise the Lord of Satan. Come on, people, let me hear you praise the Lord of Satan. And it's said under the breath that you can't quite hear what is said. What about cursing people? Have you ever seen in the Bible where Paul sends out a curse into the people? No, because it's not there. Christians, true Christians, Protestant Christians don't get involved in curses. That comes from pagan times. Watch this. Yes, Lord, I'll do it. I place a curse on every man and every woman that will stretch his hand against this anointing. 
I curse that man who dares to speak a word against this ministry. I curse that man. And he's, yes, Lord, I'll do it. And he blames God. If he is speaking to somebody, it's not God. There's only one force in the universe that sends out curses, and that's Satan, not God. What about our friend um, Kenneth Copeland? What about Kenneth Copeland? He's such a good man with his beautiful wife, Gloria Copeland. He couldn't be involved in any of this, could he? Well, in the Force of Love audio tape from 1987, he says, you don't have a God in you. You are one. This is, can you remember? Pantheism. He says on Praise the Lord TV show, he says the following. Now Peter said by exceeding great and precious promises, you become partakers of the divine class. All right, are we gods? Oh, we are a class of gods. Incredible. Pantheism, pantheism, pantheism. Over, it's subtle, it's disguised, it's covered up. But it's pantheism. You know that f uh, following the faith of Abraham 1 on side 2 or side 1 at least that Kenneth Copeland said this? He said that Adam was God manifest in the flesh. God's reason for creating Adam was his desire to reproduce himself. He did just that. He was not a little like God. He was not almost like God. He was not subordinate to God even. Adam is as much like God as you could get. Just the same as Jesus. Adam in the Garden of Eden was God manifest in the flesh. Wow! Man, this man is, is this God language or is this serpent language? God manifest. Not, Adam wasn't subordinate to God. He was equal to God. He was God manifest in the flesh. This is serpent language. Now, how is he involved and what does he get involved with? I'll show you just now the cover of his book and then you'll see for yourself. But he speaks about the biggest failure. And can you believe it? Just as Rick Warren blames God for the music, and that Benny Hinn blames God for cursing people, Kenneth Copeland blames God for being the biggest failure? Listen to this. I was shocked when I found out who the biggest failure in the Bible actually is. The biggest one in the whole Bible is God. Mm. <laughs> oh, what, what, what? Don't you turn that set off. <laughs> you listen to what? You, I told you now, you sit still a minute. You know me well enough. No, I wouldn't, I wouldn't tell something that I can't prove with the Bible. He lost his top-ranking, most anointed angel, the first man he ever created, first woman he ever created, the whole earth, and all the fullness therein, a third of the angels at least. God is the biggest failure because he lost his highest top-ranking angel. A third of the angels, the whole earth, his, the, his creation, even mankind. See how they twist it? This is called occult theology within Christianity. This is just hidden insider esoteric teachings coming out into the exoteric side. But because we are so excited about getting all these manifestations and feeling our association to God, we don't pick up and notice. When the Lord says, be sober, be vigilant, gird up the loins of your mind, we don't do that anymore because now we feel our association and these 0.005% poisons come in and they are the ones that corrupt our soul. Kenneth Copeland is also known well for getting drunk on the Holy Spirit. What was started uh, a while ago by Rodney Howard Brown, the Toronto blessing and poured into the Rima church with, with uh, Kenneth Hagen. The same thing with Kenneth Copeland, getting drunk on the Holy Spirit. Watch how he blames God for this blasphemy. Getting drunk on the Holy Ghost instead of that <laughs> Jim Bean or something, you know. I pray, God, hallelujah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, glory to God. Yeah, I get to do this for Jesus. <laughs> Incredible. I get to do this for Jesus. Praise God. I mean, this man is sick, but it's hidden. It's not openly shown that 99.995% of the time what you see on TV is not this stuff. We have to bring these to the fore that you can see what the real true character is of these people underneath. 
Kenneth Copeland, here is the front of his book. How to build your firm foundation. What do you notice in the front of his book? Can you see a compass and a set square? Does this start to sound familiar now? Compass and a set square. But it's not in the form of Freemasonry. He lays it out to the side that you can't quite see who it is. These people are insider Masons. They're there to twist Christianity away from God. And even on the front of their book is a signal picture that says, this is who I'm affiliated to. And listen to what he says in the Believer's Voice of Victory broadcast from the July 9th, 1987. Listen to what he says on this. And I say this with all respect, that it don't upset you too bad, but I say it anyway. When I read in the Bible where he says, that's God says, I am, I just smile and say, yes, I am too. <laughs> where God says, when he's reading the word of God, Kenneth Cope, when, he, when, God, when he's reading God's word and God says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, etc. He says, no, me too. Pantheism, insider pantheism, disguised as Christianity. You know, the promise keepers from July 1997, Kenneth Hagen placed the Masonic obelisk on the cover of his magazine. Can you imagine? Look at that. The word of faith. There you have the Masonic obelisk. This is the worship temple of the sun god. I'll show you this in the lecture, an image to the beast. The dwelling place of the sun god. All power under one man is what it symbolizes. The power of the sun god. And yet this is on the front of Kenneth Hagen's um, um, uh, magazine. What's Kenneth Hagen up about? What's he up to? Well, he and his wife started the Rima Church. And you can see it's also got the wreath of Apollo, same as what the United Nations has got. And they're the Rima Bible Church. Often when you see the Rima symbol, you'll see that it's also got this uh, crown with the cross through it, which you saw also on the, uh, on the grave of the Jehovah's Witness, the, the founder of the Jehovah's Witnesses. It comes from Templars. This is the insider Templar system. The, this is the front entrance, Rima Bible Training Center, the spoken word. All appears to be very godly. But yet, when you get deeper underneath the surface, you have a look and you see these people getting drunk on the Holy Spirit. And if you think getting drunk on the Holy Spirit is a gift from God, I'll get to that just now. Just bear with me. Watch Kenneth Hagin. He's now the, the founder of the Rima Church worldwide. A wealthy, 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 wealthy man from the system that he's built. Watch this and if you've got an ounce of the Holy Spirit in you, listen to what the Holy Spirit says and tell me, is this the will of God? Drunk again. <laughs> this is the first time we've had a full manifestation of that anointing. We got there. Yeah, we got there. He says, this is the first time we've had a full manifestation of that. Interesting words. The manifestation is not from God. This is a demonic spirit which is being filtered into the charismatic and the Pentecostal churches. And he says this is the first manifestation, full manifestation that we've had. Have you got that? And they say, yes. He says, have you got that? And, go, ah! and now they feel their association with God. God has blessed us. He sent us his Holy Spirit. No, be careful. What are these people busy with? They're pulling you off the word of God and feeling your association through your feelings rather than through the word of God. What about in the same event where Kenneth Hagen blesses Kenneth Copeland? Does this look like a respectable, reverent, as child of God who preaches the word of God? Watch this. <laughs> This is pathetic. 
This is absolutely ridiculous, these people. And then they receive their millions for doing this work. Absolute millions. They go on TV and through Trinity Broadcast Network, which you've s I've showed you in the first half of this, where they've got the Masonic handshakes and all these various things. Unbelievable things are taking place in these churches. And then they blame God. God is sending His Holy Spirit. It's always God's fault. Do you remember in a lecture or two ago when I spoke about the battle for the mind, I showed you the various satanic hand signals, the one with the two fingers up and the two fingers down, where the, the one in the middle um, with the thumb across means that under the power of the Holy Ghost, the Trinity is under the power of the Satan. Well, I showed you that that was seen not only in politics. We saw it on the back of the Satanic Bible, Anton LaVey, you can see there. Also in the Satanic ritual, there's a greeting for Satan. Avril Lavigne with her black makeup, uh, she's, she's associated to Satan. Also heavy metal rockers, same thing. George Bush in his Masonic suit showing at his inauguration the horned cornuto or the horned hand side. Now, what about the other pastors, the religious pastors? Do they use the satanic symbol? Well, please watch for two occasions in this one little short clip where Benny Hinn does exactly that. He first starts out and he walks around and then he puts out two fingers, three fingers, and then th I'll get to that. Just I'll cover it again. Watch this very carefully. Pause it and rewind if you have to. Before when him. you enter that, Holy temple. What sacrifice? Say. Shedding of blood. Say it. Battles. When you enter that holy temple, he says. When you enter that holy temple. See, you've got to take it with the word association as well. Then he says one, two, and battles. Got to do with pointing out who he's referring to. Here's an image or a, or a video clip of uh, Kevin Copeland doing the same thing. Have a look. This is the Believer's Voice of Victory broadcast. Today, Gloria Copeland, my wife, will be concluding her series on the spirit of faith. My wife, Gloria Copeland, will be completing her series on... So it's the series that's actually being based on this. Can it be? Have a look at another one. What about this one of Kevin, Ke Kenneth Copeland? Jesus' physical nature is the, he has the traits of his mother. He says, and let me just put this away, Jesus' physical nature. You see who he's referring to? This Jesus' physical nature. And then he says this Catholic thing. He says, he gets his traits from his mother. So he's an insider believing in the false trinity. The, not the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. This is the Father, Mother, Child, Pagan trinity that comes from ancient Egypt. But Jesus' physical nature, that's what he says. Have a look at this one from Jesse Duplantis, another one of these big mega preachers. Attack me. I do know when I start doing things for God in a big way, like buying more television time, building. I know when I do something for God, like buying which part? That God. Check us out. Another one. Hidden channels of communication. God had prepared that man to meet us so we could be a blessing to him. God had prepared that man to meet us that he, we can be a blessing to him. That man. Incredible. These people have been placed inside Christianity to lead people by the nose without them even knowing that they're getting involved in error. Here's just an image of some of them that use this hand sign. You'll see the same from Rodney Howard Brown. As I've showed you, Jesse Duplantis, Kenneth Copeland, one by one they show their truth colors. What about Ro Rodney Howard Brown? Well, I've explained this man was the, the person who started this idea of the Toronto blessing, this laughing, this getting drunk on the Holy Spirit. He was even known as the Holy Spirit bartender where he can pour out this drunkenness into his congregation. This is not the Holy Spirit. Reinhard Bonker, who's from the, from the Episcopal churches, who, who hires out valleys at a time. He goes into Africa and he hires out valleys. And people come there in there thousands upon thousands, hundreds of thousands at a time. And they donate their very last cent in the hope that this man can pronounce a blessing. 
This is sick. This is from the seat of Satan. This has not got anything to do with God. And yet he's got people that believe him all over the world. One of the most effective in this healing miracle thing is TB Joshua. And I've, I've got video clips on it, but I'm not going to add it in. I've showed you enough in this, in this lecture about people where they did, on SABC3 in South Africa, they did a study on the people that were healed at, at TB Joshua. And I can't remember if it was 99%, but it was almost all, if not all of them, fell ill, worse, or came back to where they were. Except that they were so wound up, where the adrenaline was so pumped when they were in this presence and they were praying and praying and praying and praying for these blessings and that they were so excited when they when they got the final laying on of hands from this tb joshua that boom they were healed they convinced themselves that they were healed but their bodies weren't healed tb joshua is not a prophet from god he says i was sent to earth to save the world excuse me i believe jesus christ I thought it was Jesus that was sent to the earth to save the world. Who are you? Just because you use the name Jesus Christ doesn't mean that you're aligned with his doctrines. He says in the Built newspaper on the 2nd of May 2001, the divine person in me can do a million things simultaneously. This is pantheism. I can appear to thousands of people in their dreams in any part of the world to set them free of their sicknesses, problems or afflictions. He's a pantheist and he drives people through the ancient pagan rituals of getting excited about your association with healing rather than the physical word of God. You remember I explained at the beginning of this lecture that mystic Babylon has got three parts. The dragon, the beast and the false prophet. The, the dragon is Satan. The beast is the antichrist beast. And the false prophet is false Christianity, false Protestantism. Revelation 13 verse 13 says, And he performed great miraculous signs, even causing fire to come down from heaven to earth in the full view of men. Because of the signs he was given power to do on behalf of the first beast, he deceived the inhabitants of the earth. Question. When did a fire come from heaven? Well, let me just pause that for a moment. Let me rewind. Uh, according to this text, and I just want to read it again, he performed great and miraculous signs causing fire to come down from heaven in the full view of men. And because of those signs, he deceived the inhabitants of the earth. So the second beast will cause fire to come down from heaven in order to deceive, right? Question. When did fire come down from heaven in the New Testament. Can you remember? When did fire come down? When did they have the cloven tongues of fire from heaven? It was on Pentecost. What happened on Pentecost? Well, let's read it out of the Bible to make sure that I'm not saying that the Bible's saying it. These people have to say what they're saying and the Bible has to say what it's saying. Acts 2. In verse 1 it says, And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord and in one place. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire, and it sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues. So they began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And they were all amazed and marveled, saying one to another, Behold, are not all these which speak Galileans? And how hear we every man in our own tongue wherein we were born. There was something strange that happened here. There were, uh, there were a whole bunch of languages that came together inside this uh, group that were, that were there on the day of Pentecost. And uh, I can't remember the exact figure. I think it was 15. There were some many, many languages that came together. And then one of the big problems that they had is that they couldn't understand the gospel as it was being taught. And with the pouring out of the Holy Spirit, the cloven tongues came down on each one of them and all of a sudden they spoke in tongues. Now the word here in tongues points to a literal language, meaning that I can speak three languages, English, Afrikaans and German, and all of a sudden now I can speak Spanish as well. Or a friend who can only speak English, all of a sudden they can speak German, just like that. Or somebody else can speak Chinese or Hindi. 
Why is somebody given the power to speak a new language? To fulfill the calling of the gospel. To go out and share this truth with the world. It was the reason the Holy Spirit is given or the gifts of the Holy Spirit are given in order to take this message out. And as a person that can't speak Spanish, I can't take this message to the Spaniards. But if the Lord decides to give me the gift of tongues and He decides which language I must have, then boom, I know, right? I've received Spanish. I must obviously go to a Spanish community to be able to share this message. In Acts 2, 1 to 8 is an example that clearly describes tongues or another language, speaking in another language. It's a cognitive, clear, understandable language. Not some tongue-twisting garbage, whatever it is that these people that do that speak in tongues. That's not from the Bible. There are three or two other places in the Bible where speaking in tongues is less clear. But a clear study on that, not in the new Bibles where they've changed the word to say literal tongues. Go to the original and do a study on it. And you'll realize that the word there means literal tongues. The language of angels is the angels pour out the blessing of the Holy Spirit upon mankind. It's the language that's given from heaven. A new language to be able to speak. This babbling that is done in the speaking of tongues, I'll show you in a minute where that comes from. But remember, this beast will cause fire to come from heaven. In other words, there will be a false Holy Spirit falling on the people. And this beast will also have an unclean spirit like a frog come out of its mouth. This false Protestantism will have a, a, a frog come out of its mouth. Question, how does a frog catch its prey? With its tongue. This is a beast that causes fire, false Holy Spirit, to come from heaven and cause you to catch your prey with speaking in tongues. Not only speaking in tongues, but many other ways. The most, two most prominent uh, phenomena available or that are seen in the charismatic and Pentecostal movements are speaking in tongues and prophesying. Now, I'm not going to go into prophesying in this lecture. It is, prophecy is such a reverent subject, we need to spend a whole lecture on that. And I'll do that right at the end of the lecture series. One or two before the end of the lecture series. It's called, the lecture is called A Gift of Prophecy. But if you're involved in prophesying or if you have had somebody speak prophecies over you, I urge you to get that DVD because there are eight biblical characteristics which you can use to identify if somebody is a true prophet of God. If you don't know what they are, get the DVD. I'm not going to go into that now. But prophesying is very, very clearly a gift of the Holy Spirit. And you don't receive the Holy Spirit. You received a gift of the Holy Spirit. And today this modern speaking in tongues is argued to be a physical manifestation of the pouring out of the Holy Spirit. But that can't be because that would contradict Scripture. We have to test the Scripture if it is from God, what, we, what we're busy getting. And if, the, like it is promoted, that speaking in tongues is a requirement for you to realize that you've received the Holy Spirit, then ask yourself, why does the Bible speak about in Acts 5 verse 32, who receives it not everybody receives speaking in tongues not everybody receives the holy spirit did you know that the gift is given to everybody in their individual capacity according to the will of god he will give you a gift of speaking in a new language he'll give the next person a gift of being able to prophesy he'll give the next person the gift of being an evangelist and so he will give these gifts out so that his his uh a truth can go to the ends of the earth. That's the reason why the Holy Spirit gives these gifts to strengthen and to give the tools to the people to take this truth out into the world. But when these, these ideas of speaking in tongues as a requirement or as a, as a recognition of the pouring of the Holy Spirit, pouring out of the Holy Spirit is used, they forget about Acts 5 verse 32. It very clearly says there, and we are witnesses to these things and so is the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to those who what? Obey Him. Who does God give the Holy Spirit to? Those who obey Him. Now, my question to you is, if you've experienced speaking in tongues, if you yourself speak in tongues, or if you know somebody that does speak in tongues, just ask them the same question. Ask yourself this question. 
Next time that I'm at church or in a com group of people, whatever, either charismatic or Pentecostal or somebody where they have this, this outpouring of the Holy Spirit, you know in your community or in your church who is doing what. And that's an unfortunate truth about congregations. We know what the people are busy with. Sometimes we know that so-and-so is sleeping with so-and-so or so-and-so is doing this wrong or stole that or etc. etc. We know quite clearly and quite quickly who's sticking to the word of God. All ten commandments, not nine, all ten of them. In your community, in your church, is there somebody that is not sticking in truth to the word of God? Say for example somebody is doing adultery. And then on Sunday when you go to church and you watch this happen, just ask yourself, how can that person receive the Holy Spirit if they are breaking the word of God? The Lord clearly says that the Holy Spirit is poured out to those who obey Him. That's the requirement. In obedience to God, in other words, you have to be in complete submission, in complete alignment with the true law of God. 100%, not 9 out of 10, not 8 out of 10, not 7 out of 10, 10 out of 10 of the 10 commandments and a relationship with God like Paul had. If Paul was given the gift of speaking in tongues, just ask yourself, and he called himself the least of the apostles. Who are you? Are you worthy of receiving it? I don't know. You need to ask yourself that. If you've been involved in somehow breaking the law of God and you've received the gift of the Holy Spirit pouring out or of speaking in tongues and you've disobeyed the law of God, then you know that whatever you're receiving is not from God. Otherwise, God isn't true. Otherwise, He's breaking His own word. This prophecy thing is really a hot subject in my country in South Africa. People are forever prophesying over each other and trying to predict the future. That's divination. The Bible warns about that. But in some cases, they even call themselves a prophet. And if you go to spiritword.org.za, you can find out about a man called Kubis van Rensburg, who's called himself the prophet. And he's got a following, a huge following of people that now come to worship with him and his wife. He is the prophet in South Africa, the prophet, the man who does these wonderful healings. He, interestingly enough, he received this gift after he spent some time with TB Joshua. Now, just want, before I show you this video clip, I want you to, for a moment, think back into the lectures. If the Ark of the Covenant was no longer valid, if the sanctuary was no longer valid, but at one time God said that this was the seat of the Shekinah glory, the mercy seat, the throne of God, the top of the Ark of the Covenant in between the, sh the covering cherubs and the Shekinah glory. If at one point in time in history that was sacred to God, do you think that somehow God would today disregard it and somehow get rid of it or treat it badly? Obviously not. It would be treated with the same respect. Otherwise, Malachi would be wrong when he says, I change, God says, I change not. I am the Lord, I change not. And in the Old Testament sanctuary, we've shown you that it's in the New Testament gospel is the same thing. Therefore, the Ark of the Covenant is still as holy today as it was ever in history. Not only that, the Ark of the Covenant points towards the Holy of Holies in heaven, this sanctuary in heaven where Jesus is ministering on our behalf. Just take for a moment Sit for a moment and, and, and take the time to watch this clip. Here you have the prophet in South Africa doing something with the Ark of the Covenant. And I want you to notice sort of two-thirds into the clip, some, somebody, I would rather say somebody rather than something, somebody speaks to him and then he says, break it, break it, he told me to break it. And ask yourself, is this God speaking or is this a demon speaking to the prophet in South Africa? Thank you. <laughs> no more. Takes out a sword. He chops the, the angel into the Ark of the Covenant. Now listen. Joy! Joy! Oh, Jesus, help me. Oh, Jesus, help me. You see, he blames God again. Oh, can you take it? Yeah. 
Oh, man. Now he takes out the mercy seat. Ten commandments. No more. Look at the reaction from the, the people. Pot the pot no of manna. He smashes it. Star by heaven. No more. This man's possessed. Now listen, he speaks to him. Break the thing. Break the thing. Sure. Break it. Break it. Break it. Oh my goodness. Break it. He said break it. He said break it. He said break it. Now listen very carefully to the last words. When I chopped that first thing, attacking that dragon. Oh, forgive me. Don't. When I chopped that first thing, attacking that dragon. Uh, I mean, I mean, I mean. This is not from God. This is from Satan. And it's inside Protestantism. The Lord is calling us, come out and be separate. Please don't have any part of this. Just have a look what happened in the old pagan days and you realize it's the same thing. It's amazing to see that all the above quotes I've given you, all of the above video clips are all in modern day Protestantism. But the manifestation of the Holy Spirit as it's seen today is seen in old pagan cultures. You go back in history to the time of Egypt and you'll see that what you see today in the charismatic churches is the same as what you see there. And if you don't believe me, take your time, and I'm going to flip through this uh, table very quickly. Take your time, pause on it, and go and check. What you see in the charismatic churches today is the same as what you've seen throughout history, but it's been called paganism. Here you have the top manifestation. Y then you've got Kundalini Yoga, Satyaya, Subud, Kigong, and the Shakers. Those are different types of pagan religions or like kundalini yoga uncoils the spine that's supposedly wrapped at the base, the, the snake that's wrapped at the base of the spine. Those are various pagan things that you can do or Pentecostal and charismatic. For those that understand the African culture, please have a look at the African voodoo or witch doctor column on the right hand side. Have a look at this. Slain in the spirit. You find it in Kundalini Yoga, you find it in Subud, you find it in Qigong, you find it in Shakers, and you find it in the Pentecostal and Charismatic movement. You remember when I showed you Kenneth Hagin, where he was leaning on his bodyguards, where he was like a drunk idiot walking around, and then they zoomed out, and also with Kenneth Copeland, when he was dancing around, there were people slain in the spirit on the floor. This happens in pagan cultures, it doesn't happen in Christianity. What about the next example? Uncontrollable laughing, which they have now called... Toronto blessing. You see it in Kundalini Yoga, you see it in Subud, you see it in Qigong, you see it in Shakers, and you see it in the charismatic movement, except you don't get any Bible examples of it. Physical jerks. You get it in Kundalini Yoga, Subud, Qigong, Shakers, and the charismatics. Animal sounds, roaring, Kundalini Yoga, Subud, Qigong, Shakers, and the charismatic movement. New spiritual insights and revelations. Things that are new enlightenment that's given on the Bible. That's the same stuff as you see in Kundalini Yoga, Satya Sai, Tsubud, Kigong, Shakers, and the charismatic movement. The same with spontaneous movements. The same with the leaders are divine. He's the prophet. He's Joshua, TB Joshua. He's uh, uh, Kenneth Copeland, Kenneth Hagen, all of these magnificent men. The leaders are divine. Same as in the, the pagan movement. Revival type meetings where they have the valleys to go and wake people up into this new revival, this new way of living. Same in all of these things, including the charismatics. You also feel energy surge like electricity or fire through your body. Same as in the pagan cultures. Repetitive singing and chanting. Same as in kundalini yoga. Clearing of the mind, emotionalism and anti-intellectual. In other words, don't think about it. Open your mind. Let the Holy Spirit come into you and start speaking in tongues. Open your mind. I invite the Lord to come into you. This is available in the pagan cultures. Now remember that paganism is 180 degrees split away from the Bible. 
It is no way comparative to the true word of God. This is what you see today in charismatic movement and in the Pentecostal movement. Also, the leaders are so wealthy. They are so wealthy. They make millions of, of, of rands or dollars, depending which area of the world you are. Also, they speak in undecipherable tongues. These people are speaking in tongues. This gobbledygook, we call it in Afrikaans, bubble tal. It's got to do with this gobbledygook that these people speak. This is available in the pagan cultures as well as the charismatic and Pentecostals. What about being awakening through the laying on of hands? Paganism and charismatic. Many miracles and healing. Paganism, 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 paganism and charismatics. Prophecy. This is why we have to do a whole lecture on prophecy because the same prophecies that you get today in Kundalini, uh, in Kundalini Yoga is the same as what you get in the Pentecostal Charismatic and all the other pagan religions. Even the same with trances, going into a trance, seeing visions and mind reading, saying you are now thinking the following and all this mind reading, that doesn't come from God, that comes from Satan. He's just marked, he's just packaged his, his lies in a new way and he's filtered it back into Christianity. Remember where this comes from? The Jesuits through to Edward Irving and through into the Pentecostal and Charismatic movements. The top New Agers know this. They know that it's not from God. They know that it's actually from the coming one, the capital C, capital O, the coming one, the Lucifer. This is from Elizabeth MacDonald. Interestingly, Benjamin Cream, the person who is representing the Maitreya or the New Age Christ, has recently asked about the Toronto blessing. His response was that he thought the Toronto blessing was a good thing. It is, according to him, the method being used by his spiritual masters to soften up Christian fundamentalists to accept the New Age Christ when he appears. Because your mind will be so clouded with the, the effects of feeling your association with God that you won't know how to defend yourself with the word of God anymore. It says in the Bible, in Isaiah 8 verse 20, to the law and to the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. Not a little bit of light, not more than a little bit. Nada, zip, zilch, no light in them. If they speak not according to the word of God, there is no light in them. See the problem? Matthew 7 verse 13 to 14 says, it's not going to be there where all the cars are. It's not going to be in the revival meetings where they hire out big valleys or big marquee tents. Enter by the narrow gate, it says. For the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction. And those who enter by it are many. For the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life. And those who find it are few. The call from heaven today says, please be careful. 1 Peter 5 verse 8 says, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil as a roaring lion walketh about seeing whom he may devour. It also speaks in 2 Corinthians 2.11 that lest Satan should get an advantage of us, if we are not ignorant of his devices. After this lecture, you won't be ignorant of his devices. You can say, but hold on a second. Let me check whether what I'm experiencing is from the word of God or if it's associating to my feelings to decide what's true and what's not. This is all leading towards being deceived into receiving the mark of the beast. Read Re Revelation 19 verse 20. And the beast was taken and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast and them that worshipped his image. These both were cast alive into a lake of fire burning with brimstone. People are going to be deceived into receiving the mark of the beast. Can you imagine that? We get into the mark of the beast in the, in the lecture entitled The Three Angels' Messages and the Mark of the Beast and we'll discuss exactly that. But please, if you find yourself or your relatives or a friend in any way associated with either the charismatic, the Pentecostal movement, or Protestantism in general, give them a copy of this DVD. Give them the opportunity to question whether what they are experiencing is truly from God. Thank you.